Check out what a Kansas State Republican committee wrote. This is right after the compromise, the great compromise, a.k.a. betrayal of black America, where the Republicans gave in to the Democrat demands and removed the troops out of the South so that the Democrats could be uh, demons in flesh form. But check this out. This is what they said. I think the policy of the new administration will be to conciliate to the white men of the South. Carpet baggers to the rear and negresses take care of yourselves. An article pub this this was said in an article that was published in a newspaper or periodical called The Nation. They predicted that the Negro would disappear from the field of national politics. Henceforth, the nation as a nation will have nothing more to do with Doesn't him. Doesn't that sound familiar? They've been trying to do this for over 400 years. First of all, wait, you wasn't even included, man. They didn't even think about you. Then when they added you, they wanted to quickly remove you. I'll be back. should get reparations just for the great compromise betrayal for real because i don't know how many of you guys took um black american history um it goes you learn in more in details just how detrimental the gate the the great compromise was it devastated black americans for like 10 years or more they were able to build their own empire so to speak they went into politics they had they earned um high positions in politics built their communities i mean you know how they say pull yourself up from your bootstraps and none of them basically a lot of people groups were given boots to pull themselves up but black folks didn't get anything but you know black people always found a way to acquire some kind of success in this country before it was destroyed by racist um evil white men and women who had temper tantrums but anyway you don't even know the how devastating the, the great compromise affected our people so anyone who does who has not read a book about it or know in details what happened i implore you to go read a book uh, one book that i always tell people about is it's called the um before the mayflower by laron um, bennett and that will give you some um insight as to how the compromise destroyed black america and they always found a way to destroy black america some kind of way just um look at the video i did um called woodrow wilson a wicked man how he single-handedly destroyed middle class black america they always found a way to do that and then they go around and and make it seem like you know we didn't contribute or we're intellectually inferior and we can't take care of ourselves or we don't want to take care of ourselves that's the lie they use to stigmatize us but if you had half a brain and wanted to know the truth you can go find out that it was all lies if it wasn't for us this country wouldn't be as great as it is tell you the truth you can get mad and your feelings all you want to but if it wasn't for us our ideas that were stolen our inventions that were stolen how we showed you guys how to garden the whole world horticulture we're the ones who taught you that taught you how to cook and a whole litany of other things this country wouldn't be what it was if we weren't here and that's why they could talk crap about oh go back to africa the whole world is ours so we wouldn't just be going back to Africa. We're all over the world. But they know the day that we turn, uh, we if we were to turn our backs completely on this country, that's the day this country would fail. So now, 
um as i said in the video prior to this if if you haven't checked out that video i implore you to check it out um political demonization of black america at the end of that video i said that i was gonna go into california let's talk about california the golden state the state of illusions the state of images the state of is it, california reminds me of um sleeping beauty you know that beautiful apple the witch gave him the witch gave her and it was poisonous that's how california is it's is made up to look like a beautiful apple but just don't open it that's california so let's go into talk about how california demonized those called black americans let's get started the state of california entered into the union in 1850 and its constitution proclaimed that neither slavery nor involuntary servitude unless for the punishment of crimes shall ever be tolerated in this state but that very same document gave only white male citizens the right to vote and also need i remind some folks who don't know the history of california the first government what was his name peter buchanan peter buchanan something like that he was a full-blown racist let's continue <laughs> like he was the only one right from the beginning freedom in california meant something very different from white folks and black folks like it still is today as detailed in this chapter of enslavement despite california proclamation against slavery enslavers forced hundreds of enslaved black folks into the state california became one of the few free states to pass a fugitive slave law authorizing and even enforcing the ability of white californians to kidnap and traffic black folks black american californians to southern enslaving states you see that california allowed them to come in and snatch you up and take you to a slave state meanwhile free black folks free black american californians face other restrictions on their ability to participate in civic life california banned black folks and other non-white people from testifying in court against a white person in some cases this law allowed a white man to get away with murder surprise surprise in 1854 the california supreme court overturned the murder conviction of a white man because he was convicted based on a testimony of a chinese witness the testimony of chinese witnesses so it's more than one chinese person who saw this white man murder someone reversing the murder conviction the california supreme court explained let's hear what they explained in using the words no black or mulatto person or indian shall be allowed to give advice to give evidence for or against a white person the legislator adopted most comprehend adopted the most comprehensive terms to embrace every known class or shade of a color as the apparent design was to protect the white person from the influence of all testimony other than that of a person of the same caste, admitting that California designed the law to protect white defendants from justice, California Supreme Court defended the law as a matter of public policy, warning that warning that allowing any non-white person to testify would admit them to all the equal rights of citizenship and we might soon see them at the polls in the jury box upon the bench and in other legislative halls a prospect that the court viewed as an actual and present danger they said that allowing non-white people to be a witness and present evidence against a white person to convict them in a court of law was a clear and present danger. Do you see the mentality of these people? You see why it was made, it was so hard in this country? 
and then the ones the the groups where it became easier that's only became because they had the sentiments of white racists anti-blacks you want to deny it if you want to keep denying it one day you want to tell the truth let's continue one case drew public attention to the law and its effects on black american californians in 1861 a white man named rodney b shell robbed a black owned business when george w gordon a black american barber complained to the police shell shot and murdered gordon in his shop at shell's murder trial his attorneys used california's ban on non-white testimony to exclude the prosecution's key witness hiring two hairologists two not one who examined a witness's hair under a microscope you see how ludicrous this was let's continue and claimed that the witness had black blood in his veins consequently the court excluded the key testimony resulting in shell's conviction for second degree murder rather than first degree murder a black owned local newspaper called the case a mockery of justice and one of the most deliberate and cold-blooded murders that ever disgraced california even in her rudest and most lawless days one california legislator observed that shield had murdered gordon knowing that black americans testimony against him would be barred in court Another legislator proclaimed that the law banning black American testimony served as a legislative license for the commission of crimes. Though the shield trial generated a firestorm of controversy, California's legislator refused to change the law that year. Many other black American California suffered crimes without recourse to testimony and justice in court when jim howard a white man stole from a black american laundry man named albert grubbs grubbs testified and helped secure howard's conviction for grand larceny on appeal the chief justice of the california supreme court stephen j field who would later become a justice on the u.s supreme court overturned a conviction declaring that california's law categorically barred any black american testimony even if crime may go unpunished you see what we say about systemic racism you see the, are you getting a clear picture as to what systemic racism is and how it works if somebody is in a low position and they're racist and they go up to a higher position and they're racist, that's systemic racism. And then they go, they continue it on. And then they're mentoring people. And then the people that they mentor, they they stuff their biased racist mentality in them. And then it just goes on like a domino effect. Let's go on. So even if a non-white person had evidence or testimony to convict somebody who did a crime, they couldn't convict that person because the person was not the witness of the testimony came from somebody who was non-black. That is the American way, a, a, a.k.a. A, a California way. You see why reparations is required? We're not asking. It's required because you guys did crime. You committed crimes against humanity. You willfully committed crimes against humanity, humanity by denying folks their basic rights let's go on discriminated against by both the laws and those who will break it many black american californians like peter lester who was assaulted and robbed in his store but unable to testify against the perpetrators left the state from san francisco alone some 200 black american families a substantial portion of the 4,000 total black americans who has settled in california between 1850 and 1860 left during the 1850s in a mass exodus to british colonies and what is now canada other black american californians organized in response to these restrictions Black American citizens formed the Color Executive Committee and founded 
their own weekly newspaper, Mirror the Times. Drawn from Black American activism in other parts of the nation, Black American Californians held the first of four colored citizen conventions in 1855 at the St. Andrews African Methodist Episcopal Church in Sacramento. At this convention and later meetings, they advocated against slavery, urged repeal of California's law, barring black American testimony against whites in state courts and petition for the right to vote. After an eight year campaign, convention delegates convinced the California legislator to repel its ban on black American testimony in 1863. As soon as the ban on black American testimony ended, black American California spearheaded legal efforts to protect their rights in court. Black American women organized legal efforts to file charges against streetcar drivers who refused to pick up black American riders or harass them on the car. In other cases, black American testimony proved crucial to preventing black American Californians from being enslaved. 13 years after California entered the Union as a free state, in 1863, an enslaver purchased and trafficked a 12-year-old black American girl, Edith, selling her to a former in Sacramento County. But a free black American man named Daniel Blue intervened on her behalf filing a case in court. With his testimony and testimony of other black American citizens, he persuaded the sacrimony probate judge to remove Edith from the enslaver's custody. After the repeal on the ban on black American testimony in 1863 and the abolition of slavery in 1865, and slavery being abolished in 1865, black American activists in California turned their attention to voting rights. The California Colored Citizens Convention in 1865 petitioned the state legislator for a constitutional amendment to give black Americans voting rights. But when a Republican state senator presented the petition to the state legislator, its members never discussed it. In the following two years, black American activists drafted another petition asking the state legislator to grant voting rights to black American men. But then, if approved by two-thirds votes by the state assembly and the state senate. But by then, the Democrats had taken over the legislature after campaigning on anti-Black American and anti-Chinese platforms. Oh, what short memory the Asian community has. That's a damn shame. That is a damn shame that other groups have went through hell in this country, but not as much hell as black folks. But you went through hell in this country, too, and you are such a sellout. How many um, how many tokens did they give you to sell out? You Judas. Let's continue. Black American activists could not find a single member of the state legislator who would agree to present the petition for the state legislator's consideration. California continued to deny equal rights for its black American citizens. When the United States adopted the 14th Amendment to the United States Constitution in 1868, guaranteeing the equal protection of law to black Americans, the California legislator ignored the amendment and never ratified it. Similarly, California later refused to ratify the 15th Amendment, which prohibited states from discriminating against voters on the basis of race. Nevertheless, enough states voted for the 15th Amendment to make it the law of the country in 1870. And upon its ratification, Black American Californians registered to vote in droves. But California officials openly refused to abide by the 15th Amendment. Surprise, surprise. But they are the ones that, <laughs> who are the main group? Who is the main group that consistently preach obey the law? When it comes to other folks, obey the law. You better obey that law, niggers. But when it comes to them, they're like, what? What is the law? And what does it have to do with me? Let's continue. 
California's Attorney General Joseph Hamilton instructed county clerks not to register black American voters until Congress passed legislation commanding them to do so. When black American Californians and other allies protested in response, in some areas, county clerks caved to public pressure and eventually permitted black American Californians to vote. Others resisted more firmly. In Southern California, Louis G. Green was the first black American Californian in Los Angeles who tried to register to vote. When the Los Angeles County clerk refused to allow him to do so, Green filed suit in court. The county judge, who was the brother-in-law of the county clerk being sued, upheld the clerk's refusal to register Green. And that is, again, folks. A lesson in systemic racism. Say it again with me, class. Let me repeat that. What happened? What this what this county clerk, what was it? County clerk judge? The county judge. Listen to what the county judge did, who was the brother of the county clerk. When the Los Angeles, okay, Louis Green, he sued the county clerk for the right to register to vote. The county clerk refused to allow him to do so. Then Green filed a suit in the court. And the court, the county court judge, was no other than the court clerk's brother-in-law. And he upheld the court clerk's, the county clerk's decision to not let Green, a black man, register to vote. That, my dear friends, it's what you call systemic racism. Let's go on. Recognizing the resistance of black American voting in California and other states, Congress enacted the Enforcement Act in 1870, a federal law imposing penalties for states who violated the 15th Amendment. Only after the passage of this law did California officials submit and allow black American men to register to vote. It would take California nearly another decade to change its constitution to partly conform to the 15th Amendment's requirements in 1879 and nearly another century to formally ratify the 14th and 15th Amendments to the U.S. Constitution in 1959 and 1962, respectively. See how they can drag their heels when they want to? But let somebody else do something. Go in there and and steal your loaf of bread and see what happens. Well, I don't know what they're doing about people stealing loaves of bread now. I don't think they'll do too much to them, but... Like, what is that saying? Laws for, for, um, for thee and not for me? Yep. Pretty much. That's that's been the consensus of the mentality of um, some white Americans in this country. Okay, that would end the discussion about California messy, California's messy corruption and anti-black sentiments. Um, let's talk a little bit about devices used to suppress black American political participation and racial terror to suppress black American political power. Though black Americans strove to build and maintain the promise of black American citizenship after emancipation, a.k.a. the infamous emancipation is how I, what I call it, the end of the Reconstruction left them unprotected against the white supremacists who had previously enslaved them. After Reconstruction, white Americans in both the North and South employed a host of devices to reassert white supremacy and suppressed black American political power. As a result, black Americans who had already been voting for many years were barred from voting. These are some of the things that white races um, took to doing against black folks. Some of their antics. White Americans resorted to kidnapping, mass murder and other forms of racial terror to reassert white supremacy and destroy black American political power all across the southern states. 
The federal and Republican run state governments tried to suppress this violence, but white local officials and law enforcement across the South often turned a blind eye or even participated in the violence themselves. Federal and state officials themselves have used their power to target and terrorize civil rights leaders. White Americans in both the North and South began to protest federal military intervention in local affairs. According to one historian, the spectacle of soldiers marching into the hall and expelling members at the point of bayonet aroused more Northern opposition than any previous federal action in the South. President Grant's cabinet urged the president to wash the hands of the administration entirely of the whole business, referring to the repeated white insurrections in Louisiana and white political backlash made congressional Republicans wary of further military intervention in the South. When the Republican governor of Mississippi, a member of Grant's own party, requested federal aid against white supremacist insurrection, President Grant wrote, the whole public are tired out with these annual outbreaks in the South and are ready now to condemn any interference on the part of the government. In other words, he said, you own your own. For much of the American history, then the federal government sacrificed the lives and the rights of black Americans for political stability while white Americans in the South roth racial violence to oppress black americans and aren't they the ones that always talk about somebody's entitled doesn't that sound like entitlement let's continue despite the many threats to their lives black american activists organized in response to these campaigns of racial terror they form organizations like the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, a group of black American intellectuals and activists who partner with white liberals to pursue black American civil rights and equality, pursuing legal challenges against many of the devices described throughout this chapter. State governments sought to sabotage these efforts. Mississippi, for instance, created the Mississippi State Sovereignty Commission, an agency created to resist the civil rights movement and preserve racial segregation. I did a video on that. Uh, Mississippi something. I'll probably put a picture of the thumbnail in it. Mm-hmm. They was very vile and wicked. And people wonder why this country is so wicked. Look at the um, history. It's in the soil. That wickedness is in the soil. It's alive. And it found its way in the hearts of those who received it. And you know, I can't stand when people talk about equality. We're fighting for equality. No, you're not fighting for equality. I don't, like I said in, in several videos, I don't want equality. Because I think if in, in limiting us to equality is an insult. It's a slap in the face when you had a, a group of people who literally had didn't have to think about equality for over 400 years. They were front and center stage and nobody else mattered. So it was like, damn equality. That's how they felt. And that's how I feel. You're not going to subject me and paint me in the corner and say, oh, after all this, all this my ancestors went through and what we still going through in 2024, the only resolve is equality. We went through all this fighting and struggle and blood, sweat, and tears for equality. That's an insult. Let's continue. The commission planted clerical workers in the offices of civil rights attorneys, spied on civil rights organizations, obstructed black American voter registrations, and encouraged police harassment of black Americans. And they still doing the same thing today. The federal government at times targeted and terrorized civil rights leaders as well. During the 1950s and 60s, for instance, when Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. urged nonviolent protests to pursue racial justice, the FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover viewed Dr. King as a communist threat and ordered 
the electronic surveillance of Dr. Keene and his staff. While doing so, the FBI produced reports claiming that one of Dr. Keene's advisors was a communist, suggesting that international communists might be controlled of Dr. Keene. Though the FBI surveillance uncovered no evidence of communist influence, it uncovered evidence of Dr. King's extramarital affairs and used this information not only to try to discredit Dr. King as a leader of the civil rights movement, but also to attempt to convince Dr. King to take his own life. They are out to break me, Dr. King confided to a friend. They are out to get me, harass me, break my spirit. Hmm. Yeah, they like to talk about King a lot and 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 you know, hey, King was a nonviolent man. Maybe you should take a, a um chapter out of his book. Yeah, they try to do anything to lullaby us to sleep. It ain't gonna work. So knock it off. Let's continue. The federal government continued to surveil and sabotage other black American activists and organizations. In the 1960s and 70s, the federal government took extensive measures to surveil the Black Panther Party, using undercover agents to infiltrate the group and sow discord, contributing to its collapse. Though public exposure of the FBI surveillance activities forced the government to enact several reforms, those reforms weakened over time and FBI has reportedly resumed similar programs surveilling black American activists, including those in the Black Lives Matter. You got to wonder why this country is so stuck on us. It must be something to it. You know, for people to, to, to keep lying and saying we're so mentally inferior, you know, we're incorrigible, you know, they are nothing but negresses, so you don't have to be concerned about them. If that was true, why are you watching so tough? You know what I believe? They watching us so tough because they waiting to see what our God is going to do to them and their, for all their wickedness. Oh, they know it. That's why they watch us. They know. We the only ones that didn't know. We the only ones was thinking so lowly of ourselves. But all the time, they knew. Okay. Um, that will be the end. Uh, basically, it goes on to say um, how this country came up with, with some states in this country came up with black codes, vagrancy laws, literacy tests. All these things were done to disenfranchise black Americans from exercising their right to vote once they gain the right to vote. Now you see how they trying to bring these illegals over here and give them everything, citizenship, the right to vote. It's, it's like baffling like flipping your wig like damn y'all fought so hard against us exercising our natural born rights but now you bringing people over here who ain't never stepped foot in this country most of them ain't never stepped foot in this country didn't contribute in any kind of way now you dragging them over here giving them all these rights that we had to fight tooth and nail for now that should burn your ass black folks all the things your ancestors went through blood sweat and tears for the right to live in peace and exercise your basic rights. Some died for that. And now they got these illegals coming over here. Some of them criminals. Just giving them rights. And citizen, trying to give them citizenships and the right to vote. And your ancestors died for these rights. Were lynched for these rights. Communities burnt down. Okay. You got the message. Let's continue. So it goes on to talk about all the little um, hurdles they put up against black folks. You had to own property and poll taxes and whatnot. Black folks were always say, so poor, so they couldn't even pay the measly poll taxes. And they knew it. That's why they enacted them. Evil people. Challenger laws and witness requirements. I don't know what that meant, but it says... To exclude black American voters, states also use challenger laws and laws requiring requiring witnesses to attest to a voter's qualifications. So they had to go get a witness to attest to their qualifications. Ooh, they just went to bed and the devil just put all this in their hearts and ideas. Ooh, I got an idea for you. And they just received it. 
Um, grandfather clause, exclusion from state primary elections. White Americans also prevented black American voters from participating in state party primary primary elections. What else they did? Laws disqualifying people convicted of felonies for voting. Mm-hmm. And then who were the majority of people they put in, in jail? Gerrymandering states states also manipulated the shape in voting districts through a process called gerrymandering uh, to dilute voting power of the Black American. In addition to boring to boring Black Americans from voting, post Reconstruction states in both the North and South also excluded Black Americans from serving on juries. <laughs> wow, I wouldn't cry about that one. Though California amended its constitution in 1879 to allow non-white men to vote, the state adopted many laws similar to those adopted by northern and southern states to suppress the political participation of black Americans. California added a poll tax into its constitution in 1879, requiring payment of the average half day's wage before someone could vote. The poll tax continued until repelled in 1914 in the years after world war ii black american population in california rose dramatically with a growing presence in the state black american communities in california continue pushing for greater political representation but they face resistance and retaliation along the way california like the federal government frequently treated black american activism as a threat in 1966 when the civil rights protesters Use the slogan uh, Black Power to advocate for racial equality. The Republican candidate for Lieutenant Governor Robert Finch declared that it's wrong if any minority, including Negro people, think they can blackmail or blackjack their way into acceptance into our society or they're just dead wrong. Oh, acceptance into our society. Who said you own this society and you had a right to accept and reject? You know the mentality? They have like a God-like mentality. Let's continue. Ugh. You ain't got no more of a right to accept people into society or reject them than a beaver. When you're... Okay, let me, let me, let me go. Okay. The same year, Huey P. Newton and Bobby Seal formed the Black Panther Party in Oakland, California, seeking Black American economic empowerment and the end of police brutality. To pursue these goals, the Panthers adopted a number of community service programs, including health care clinics, a free breakfast program for school children, and police observation patrols. As with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., the federal government in California viewed the Black Panthers as a threat. Vice President Spiro Agnew labeled the Black Panthers a group of criminals. Federal Bureau of Investigation Director Hoover declared that the Black Panther Party without question represents the greatest threat to the internal security of the country. So what about these migrants coming over here? A lot of men I hear. They not a great threat. The Black Panther Party came about to for the betterment of the black community to build them up to help because nobody else was helping. So how, how are the migrants not a threat? I, I don't see them trying to build up a good community. I see them trying to snatch and rob and, and lure people and, and snatch, rob, and kill and, for, and, and link up with, with gangs. Black folks, you got to know how much of a threat you are to this country because they wouldn't spend so much time trying to find out what they can use for your downfall. And every time they try to come up with something to use for your downfall it always backfires but thankfully some of you guys are waking up and realizing and you smelling the, um, the burnt coffee in the um kitchen i've been saying this since the 90s when i saw the get down i was like i saw it <laughs> i saw it i was like all he's doing is bringing them over here to undercut us and then you have black folks that foolishly said oh they're just coming over here for a better life i said and that's not what you wanted for over 400 years that's not what your ancestors fought for a better life they they you can see that they want a better life but you didn't see that that's what 
your ancestors and you fought for a better life in a country that you mainly built? Let's continue. Through its counterintelligence program, the FBI surveilled and sabotaged the Black Panthers. The FBI sent anonymous inflammatory letters to restaurants, grocery stores, and churches to dissuade them from providing food or facilities for the free breakfast program. They didn't even want them to feed the kids. They messed up the free food program that was erected to feed the kids. To suppress the Black Panthers' newsletter activities, the FBI ordered the Internal Revenue Service to audit the organization and any income they received from distributing newsletters. Further, the FBI infiltrated the group with undercover agents and spread misinformation, paranoia, conflict, and distrust, distrust within the party. California law enforcement has also repeatedly arrested Black Panther members on harassment and public disorder charges, disrupting the organization and sapping resources away from its community service initiatives. These efforts contributed to the organization's collapse in 1982. And that's another case for reparations. Like many states in the North and South, California also stripped individuals of their right to vote when they were convicted of a felon. And that will be the end for now. I'm just trying to process as I'm reading. I'm just, it's, you can see more clearly how evil and wicked this country, not just California, but this entire country has been to those called black Americans. And yet you have some fools that still sit on a ass and reparations. You better be glad <laughs> if it was up to me, I would snatch every dime. You got every cent you got and every cent you trying to leave for your family and every dime yo parents and great grandparents left for you i wouldn't leave you with nothing if it was up to me you wouldn't even get food stamps or section eight but soon very soon you oppressors you gonna feel what it feels like to be poor poor where even poor countries don't even want you you're gonna be a reproach nobody all around this world gonna want to help you all those wicked seeds you planted, it's going to come to roost. And you're going to be asking for mercy. And you're going to be expecting and praying and hoping for mercy. And those people that you looking for mercy from going to look at you and be like, what is mercy? I don't even know what that means. Yeah, you better, you better trust and believe. Like I keep saying in multiple videos, those seeds you plant, you shall reap. I don't know what karma is. Karma is just a weak dilution of um, diluted word used to say the law of sowing, used to replace sowing and reaping. That's all karma is. Another form, like all these religions do, all they did was take things from the Bible and twist it up and add their little own tainted twist on there. But that's all karma means is sowing and reaping. So all those seeds you willfully sow, and even the ones you might not have willfully sow, but you ignorantly participated in it or you was fearful, it's gonna come back on you. Watch. It might might start seeing, I believe you're gonna start seeing it this year. Before 24 go out, you're gonna start seeing how what it looked like and how I feel to be poor and rejected. In a country that you have strong roots in, but your roots ain't as strong as ours. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you for your support and what other what what whatever way you choose to support. Thank you. And would appreciate any financial donation you have in your heart to give. It would be greatly appreciated. Thanks again for your time. Please like, comment, subscribe, and share. We would greatly appreciate that as well. Thank you, and I will see you in the next video.